Four dead people are lying on the floor of the basement. Andy, their leader, thinks that it all happened all over again, and again, and again. It's a cycle that keeps repeating each time she wonders if this time will be the last. Yet each time the answer's the same. Andy feels tired of it. A few days before, Andy's walking through the streets of Morocco. Right in front of her, Booker pulls up on his motorcycle. They smile at each other and continue walking together. Andy gives Booker the first edition of Don Quixote, which she brought especially for him. Booker reveals that he was contacted by a CIA agent they worked for eight years ago. The agent named James Copley is freelancing now, and he has a hostage situation in South Sudan. Andy doesn't want to be a part of it because their team has a rule, don't work for the same employer more than once. It's too risky. But Booker insists. Plus, the two remaining team members, Joe and Nikki, are already waiting at the hotel. Andy reluctantly follows him. While Booker is busy checking in, Andy watches the news about the next crisis in military conflicts in the world. Nearby, tourists snap selfies, accidentally capturing Andy in one. Stepping in to help with the photo, she deletes the selfie she accidentally got on. Andy walks into her hotel room to a warm welcome from Joe and Nikki. Nikki hands her a piece of baklava, sparking a guessing game about its ingredients and origin. Andy guesses correctly, making Booker the winner of the bet and all the money. Booker then reminds her that they have work to do. Nikki says that they can do some good, but Andy isn't too excited. She thinks some good means nothing. There's still too much horror, pain, and violence in the world. Joe reminds her that it's been a year since they've been on vacation, and Nikki says it's their job to save people. Andy agrees to meet with Copley. Talking to the former agent, the team finds out that James left the CIA because his wife became seriously ill. Two years ago, she died, but Copley's not yet found the strength to return to work. Then the man gets down to business. Yesterday, a school in South Sudan was attacked, teachers were killed, and 17 schoolgirls ages 8 to 13 were kidnapped. South Sudan has requested help from the U.S. but has been turned down. Nikki watches the conversation through the scope of a sniper rifle from inside the hotel while Joe listens through a microphone. Copley says the location of the hostages is known, shows some photos, and clarifies that no food is being delivered to the hostages. Most likely, they'll soon be separated and moved, after which it'll be impossible to find the girls. They need the best for a job like this. Andy says they'll invoice him when the hostages are rescued and leaves. Copley notices Nikki watching him and waves to him. As the team heads to South Sudan, they pack more than just firearms. Andy grabs the axe while Joe and Nikki take the swords. After waiting for night, the group infiltrates the base, getting rid of militants on the way. and gets to the room where the hostages are kept. However, instead of them, the team is met by machine gun fire. Everyone is shot at point-blank range. They lie on the floor for a couple of minutes, but they regenerate very quickly, rise to their feet, and rush to the attack. Soon, the enemies are finished. Andy realizes that there were no hostages. Instead, their resurrection was filmed by several hidden cameras. Copley set them up. The former agent himself is watching it all unfold in real time. The entire battle is recorded. Copley calls his employer and reports back. After getting rid of the evidence, the team huddles to plan their next move. Andy's feeling frustrated, doubting whether their actions make any real difference. Booker says he double-checked Copley and was certain he was legit, and he realizes they've accidentally revealed their immortality. Now they've got to tie up loose ends with Copley, and then the whole world can burn. Meanwhile, in Afghanistan, Marine Niall Freeman participates in the operation to find and eliminate the militant. She manages to neutralize him, but before he dies, the man slits her throat. Niall dies in the arms of her fellow soldier, and then wakes up in a field hospital without a scratch. The other immortals have a dream about Niall with details of her surroundings and the circumstances of her death. They piece together the details they've memorized, Joe draws a rough portrait, and Andy feels it's a terrible time for a new immortal to show up. 
After a brief argument, Andy sets off after Niall. Meanwhile, in London, Copley shows a videotape of the ambush to Stephen Merrick, a young pharmaceutical company executive who's ordered him to find the immortals. Merrick demands physical evidence like blood, tissues, and bones, but taking an uncontaminated sample proves impossible. Merrick then orders his men to capture the immortals and bring them to him. Niles' fellow soldiers are very suspicious of her resurrection. The command sends the girl to Germany for various tests. Niall packs up, but before landing, she's intercepted by Andy, who introduces herself by her full name, Andromash of Scythia, then knocks the girl out and takes her away. After an escape attempt, a fight, another death, and securing a promise to get answers to all questions, Niall gets back into the car. On the airplane, after talking and trying to find a rational explanation for what's happening, Niall again tries to escape by threatening to kill the pilot, then fiercely fights with Andy. But the woman once again gains the upper hand. Ah! Ah! Niall's wounds and fractures heal quickly. The girl worries that she's a Marine and the others will think she's gone AWOL. Andy clarifies that Niall's only chance to blend in with ordinary folks is by becoming a guinea pig in a lab. Finally, they reach an abandoned house near Paris. There, Niall and Andy are met by the rest of the immortals. The group tells about their past. Nikki and Joe met at the time of the Crusades when they fought on different sides, and since then have never parted again. And Booker served in the army during Napoleon's time. It also turns out that they're not quite immortal. Their ability to heal eventually disappears without warning. This is what happened to one immortal Andy knew. Niall is also told of an immortal woman named Quinn, the first of Andy's friends, who was captured, accused of witchcraft, and thrown into the sea in an Iron Maiden. Since she's immortal, Quinn is constantly drowning, resurrecting, and drowning again. After escaping, Andy searched for decades for her friend or information about her, but was never able to find Quinn and rescue her. Niall goes outside to get some air. Andy follows her, at which point the house is attacked by Merrick's men. A grenade is thrown at Booker and Nikki and Joe are kidnapped. When Booker comes back to life, Andy realizes that Copley's behind it all. She takes a sword, goes to an abandoned church nearby, and kills all of Merrick's men. Afterward, the immortals leave to find Copley and then rescue Nikki and Joe. Meanwhile, the captives are being carried in an armored van, and even though they both have zip ties on their arms, they manage to kill every single guard. Nevertheless, the immortals are forced into the airplane. They talk to each other as if nothing had happened, even joking. Copley looks at them in amazement. The immortals are brought to Merrick. He's very enthusiastic and believes that together they can accomplish great things and save humanity. But when Merrick, forgetting about caution, gets too close to Joe, the latter butts him with his head. In response, Merrick takes a letter opener from his desk and stabs Joe with it several times to make sure he's immortal. The wounds heal right before his eyes to the delight of Merrick and the other doctor, their plan is to use the immortal's genetic code to create the perfect cure, which will win them a Nobel Prize and save millions of lives. Joe and Nikki are going to be used like guinea pigs. Copley's not happy with his attitude. He suggests letting Joe and Nikki go because the doctors have already taken a lot of tissue samples from them, but the guy's going to put both of them in a cage and keep them locked up forever so that Merrick's competitors won't get to the immortals. While Andy, Booker, and Niall are trying to figure out how they can find the kidnapped team members, Andy notices that she stopped regenerating, but doesn't tell the others. Instead, the woman goes to the pharmacy, while Booker and Niall discuss the hardship of immortality, loneliness, and separation from loved ones. The pharmacy clerk helps Andy with her wound because he believes people have to help each other or they can't survive. Eventually, the three immortals reach England, take weapons, and are going to attack the Copley house. However, Niall refuses. She says that on the day she died, she killed the one who killed her. The soldiers are trained for this, but are not told how to live afterwards. Andy tries to convince Niall that she'll learn it with experience. The girl says she saw what Andy did in the church and doesn't want to be like her, killing people without even realizing why, while there's still time she wants to spend it with her family. 
Andy accepts Niles' choice, gives her the gun that Andy herself was given by Booker, and asks her to leave, and then ditch the car with the gun. Andy herself follows Booker to the house. Having done as Andy told her, Niles stops the car and is about to leave it, but suddenly discovers that Booker has given Andy a gun with an empty magazine and realizes he's a traitor. Andy and Booker enter Copley's house and see that he's been studying Andy for a long time. Suddenly, Booker shoots Andy, ties her hands behind her back, and asks her to listen to Copley. He tells her that, after the death of his wife, he devoted himself to the work of immortals, learned their secret history through legends, myths, and rumors. The immortals can stop the torment of mankind if they share their gift. Andy's disappointed by Booker's betrayal. Booker explains that he's tired of living forever, and if the secret of immortality is revealed, a way can also be found for them to finally die, as they both want it. Suddenly, Booker discovers that Andy's not regenerating, which means she's about to die as it is. Before they can do anything, Merrick's men show up with Merrick himself. Booker's taken, and he explains that Andy has lost her gift and is no longer immortal, yet Merrick stays just as interested and demands to take them both to the lab. Booker manages to apologize to Andy. Copley tries to stop Merrick, but he's knocked out cold with a blow to his head. When Andy and Booker are brought into the lab and secured in the bunks next to Joe and Nikki, Nikki says it's futile to try to keep Andy alive. All living things have their time limit, and if Andy's time is up, there's nothing that can be done about it. Despite Merrick's threats, Nikki remains calm. Niles arrives at Copley's house, and he realizes that she's another immortal that no one knows about. They talk. Copley tells her that Andy, as well as others on the team, have saved a huge number of people over the centuries and thus helped humanity, prevented quite a few conflicts, and generally saved civilization. No one knows this. Niall rethinks the importance of her immortality. Copley explains that he gave the command to Merrick because he hoped he could prevent suffering, but ended up regretting it. However, Copley knows where immortals were taken. The two of them arrive at the pharmaceutical company's main building, and Copley escorts Niall through a hallway with no cameras. The man's going to go with Niall to fix his mistake. But Niall won't let him, because she's the only one with a chance to make it out of there alive. Copley agrees, gives her a key card, and tells her that the lab is on the 15th floor. In the corridor outside the lab, Niall is killed by guards, but she quickly resurrects and deals with them. Soon, she reaches her friends, shooting back along the way, dodging a doctor who tries to sedate her with a tranquilizer. Niall then frees Andy and holds out a gun to her, however, Andy turns away. Niall manages to convince her to go, and together they neutralize the armed men who broke into the lab, after which they free the rest of the immortals. Booker asks to leave him here, but Niall refuses, even though Joe's outraged, calling Booker a traitor. Andy interrupts him. She says, we don't get a say in when it ends. We never have, but we can control how we live. Together, they head off to get Merrick. Meanwhile, Merrick pulls Andy's axe out of its sheath and looks at it with great interest. Floor by floor, office by office, the immortals advance. They're stopped by a gas grenade. It hits Joe and Nikki. The others move on. The head of security beats up a recovering Nikki, though Joe tries to come to the rescue. Nikki's killed with a shot to the head. The head of security runs away, and Joe stays with Nikki. He soon regains consciousness, picks up his gun, and commands, Let's go. As Booker and Niall exchange fire with the enemies, Andy grabs a fire axe, swapping it for her old one. Even without her immortality, she manages to overpower a member of the security team without killing him. The man reveals Merrick's location, the penthouse. Andy orders to use the assault tactics from Sao Paulo in 1834. The team decides to split up. The remaining guards protect Merrick, holding the door at gunpoint while he himself stands at the top of the stairs with an axe in hand. He asks how many more reinforcements are coming to them, but the head of the guards explains they are all that are left. Joe breaks into the penthouse through the window and a gunfight ensues. Hearing a signal, Andy and Niall come in through the door, then Booker joins them. Soon the room is cleared, but Merrick is nowhere to be found and the elevator is headed downstairs. Deciding that Merrick is inside, everyone except Niall and Andy, who's still not feeling well after being wounded, rush after him. 
Niall and Andy are having a heart-to-heart -heart conversation when suddenly Merrick appears. He threatens to shoot Andy, accusing the woman of selfishness and of not wanting to share immortality, saving millions of lives. Outsmarting him, Andy and Niall seize his weapon, and then Niall, grabbing Merrick, jumps out of the window with him and falls on the car parked below. When the rest of the immortals approach her, the girl is already healing. Faster than the elevator, Joe remarks thoughtfully. Taking Andy's axe, the immortals leave together. After getting cleaned up, they stop at a bar with 500 years of history. The team discusses what to do with Booker while he waits outside. In the end, they sentence him to staying alone for 100 years, and then everyone will see each other again at the same bar. However, Andy will no longer be with the team. She simply won't live that long. Niall joins the Immortals as her replacement. The Immortals also make an agreement with Copley. He will find missions for them and clean up all the traces of their existence so that they can continue to work for the good of mankind. The former agent gladly agrees. After half a year passes, Booker indulges in heavy drinking. Returning to his place in Paris, he encounters an unexpected guest, Quinn. Andy's long-lost friend, lost at sea, is waiting for him. 